Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the uh, second Skullbase uh, ERS uh, webinar. I'm uh, Sean Carey, and it's a great pleasure to uh, have you join us uh, this evening. Uh, this event is brought to you by the European Rhinologic Society and uh, kindly sponsored by um, our partner, uh, Olympus. Uh, this evening's uh, topic is something that I think is really exciting. We are going to be talking about endonasal flaps uh, and uh, what makes this evening's uh, topic uh, so interesting is we're actually going to explore what the best choice is, is in uh, individual cases. And it's a great pleasure to uh, have my uh, co-moderator, Isam Alabid uh, from Barcelona, who uh, is uh, going to lead uh, this evening's uh, session. So I shall pass over to uh, Isam, uh, who will uh, introduce his panel, and then we'll uh, start the, uh, the evening proper. Thanks very much, Isam. Thank you, Shane, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to have our uh, panelists with us. It's a pleasure from ERS to invite us to discuss about how to reconstruct skull based uh, defects. So, to start with, Dr. Saad Saleh is consultant and associated professor from the University of King Saud, Arabia Saudi. Dr. Ramon Moreno, consultant of uh, skull based unit from uh, Sevilla uh, Hospital Military, uh, Virgen Macarena. And finally, uh, Dr. Carlos Benieiro Neto is consultant associated professor of rhinology and skull base, actually uh, currently in Mayo Clinic in US. So, to start with, I invite Dr. Moreno to present algorithm, how we reconstruct the skull base. And then he will present the case to discuss with us. So Ramon, your turn. Thank you for all of you to join us. Micro, Ramon, Ramon, Micro, Ramon. No, no, sorry. Oh, okay. Okay. A little, oh, a second. Now. No. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Ramon Moreno Luna, the anti-surgeon from the University Hospital uh, Virgen Macarena in Seville, Spain. It's a pleasure uh, to be here. Uh, thanks, Dr. Alovi, Dr. Sean Kerry, and IRS for the invitation. Uh, I have nothing to disclose in this talk. Uh, uh, beginning with the talk, uh, two main questions should be answered in the beginning of the, the school-based surgery reconstruction. The first question is about the presence of fierce leak during the surgery. The second question is about the feasibility of the nasocetal flask harvesting. To identify the presence uh, of CS leak, it's mandatory to propose a reconstruction in a school based surgery, although there is no uniformity to define the fear leak grade. Uh, there is two main criteria. The first is in which it is described. The high flow leaks like an evident a communication between the nasal fossa and the subarachnoid space. I mean, with the supracellular system, for example, or another. Uh, in the other hand, the low flow leaks it could be no evident, uh, and we could not find the dermatic defect clearly during the surgery. Uh, other groups propose the classifications of the fierce leaks, including the size and the defect, but usually. Uh, we use the first classification that is easy to be understand and more useful to us. Uh, in the other hand, the question is about the feasibility of the nasocetal flap harvest during the surgery. 
actually the nasocercal flap is one of the most useful resource from the endonasal fossa in what kind of the school based effect. It is easy to be harvest, but it is associated with morbidity from the donor side. Because of the higher number of reintervention and the recent complexity of the approaches, sometimes we have no feasible nasocetal flap and we need to find alternative tools to perform the reconstruction. The first is the free autologous mucosa graft from the turbinate or from the nasal floor. The second are the lateral wall flap that are the main alternative in the, when we have no feasible nasocetal flap. Either way, uh, sometimes we need to perform an extra nasal flap. One of the most uh, used is the pericranial flap, although there are another extra nasal resource in this way. So uh, we have tried to perform a decision flow chart uh, that we are going to explain now. Uh, all the choices uh, have a lot of nuance, uh, but we think that it could be simple easy to be understand and useful to the surgeon that are listening, I hope. Uh, the, the first question about the, is, is about the presence of a fierce leak during the reconstruction. If there is no fierce leak, uh, there is no consensus in the use of wrap or flap to close a, a school-based effect without fierce leaks. Even so, uh, many groups propose the systematical use of wrap after surgery, uh, even without leaks, uh, because of the possibility of development at the light pistol. Uh, the upper case is an arachnoid nation in this way. Other situation uh, is the use of wrap in a large school-based defect covering as, as surface as we can, uh, like we can see in the bottom, uh, in the posterior wall, the frontal sinus. In both cases, uh, we use the free wrap for, for, for the endonasal, from the endonasal floor mucosal uh, if, uh, to promote a, a better healing. Uh, but actually, it's not always necessary to do a mucosal uh, reconstruction, uh, and not all the groups uh, perform it systematically. So if we have a fierce leak, uh, the, the, we should make the second question. How is the flow? If the flow leak is low, the, the, our first choice uh, could be a free endonasal mucosal graft. I mean, autologous mucosal graft. It has no vascular pedicle to preserve and no spatial limitation at the time of place it in the, in the, in the nasal cavity. There is a, a three main graft uh, from the endonasal cavity, the middle and the inferior turbinate graft and the free floor mucosal graft. The first option uh, come usually from a middle turbinectomy after performing uh, an endonasal corridor, but in a recent way, uh, some groups propose that a middle turbinectomy is not always necessary for a wide exposure during the surgery. Either way, it is the most easy yet. The inferior turbinate uh, graph is harvested uh, uh, through a partial or a total turbinectomy, but the graft resulting is, is, is so irregular and, and heterogeneous, and we don't use it so much because of the possibility of development uh, uh, an empty nose syndrome posteriorly. Recently, uh, we proposed a, a study of the free floor mucosal graft, we named it mucoplasty, in which we achieved the measurement of the endonasal floor mucosal graft from a radioanatomical study, and we describe it to uh, the, the clinical application of the mucoplasty in a school-based surgery. Uh, this graph doesn't have memory effect. Its thickness is, is more homogeneous and it, it is more adaptable uh, all over the surface and other graph. Uh, in fact, it is, it's bigger than the other one. Uh, the free floor mucosa graph, even others, uh, has been used in endoscopic sinus surgery in order to close uh, low flow leaks, like we can see in the top, and to repair the effect. Uh, of the moidal roof, uh, like we can see uh, in the bottom. It has been described in a large series of cellular closure, like we can see in the nice picture, and it can also be used uh, like a complementary procedure to close uh, low flow leaks after partial uh, necrosis in the boundaries of uh, an extended nasocetal flap, for example, in the cleaver region. On the other hand, if we have a uh, high flow leaks, the next question is about a feasible nasocetal flap. Uh, the, the nasocetal flap or other flap 
is the main vascularized flap used in school-based surgery to close high flow leaks. Uh, it could be used in, in, in all kinds of school-based defect, but its length and, and has limit in the, in the frontal area and in the inferior third of the cleaval region. Uh, for these situations, uh, the extended nasoceptal flap was, was described. Uh, this flap at the floor of the nasal fossa, giving more surface and more length. Also, uh, we can release uh, the two discrenopalatine artery from its ostium to give more, more length and more arc of rotation to the nasoceptal flap. In fact, the extended nasoceptal flap uh, is the best option to cover uh, the inferior limit of the cleaval region. Other medial flap is the anterodmoidal artery septal flap. Uh, this flap comes from the anterior third of the septum and, can, uh, and can, could include the floor of the nasal fossa. Uh, it was described to close septal perforation uh, in the beginning, but now it has been described to close and modal and frontal defects. If we have no flexible nasal flap, uh, we could use the lateral wall basic flap. Uh, the first lateral wall basic flap is the, is the middle turbinic flap. It is an interesting resource described uh, by Prevedelo uh, to close foveate modalis, uh, transplanum, and ciliar defect uh, uh, without feasible nasoceptal flap. Uh, but in fact, we think uh, that it could be used uh, preserving the nasoceptal flap to the future. Either way, uh, uh, the middle turbinic flap uh, is so difficult to be harvested, uh, and usually it's smaller than we expect. Uh, in the other hand, uh, the inferior turbinate flap is the, is the main flap from the lateral wall uh, of the nasal fossa. Uh, it is vascularized posteriorly and it could grow adding uh, the, 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 the anterior aspect of the lateral wall or, an, or, or uh, grow uh, including the floor of the nasal fossa to gain more, more length. Indeed, it is described to close a posterior defect uh, of the cleaval region and even planum defect, cellular defect without a feasible nasocetal flap. Other lateral flap is the anterolateral nasal flap or HADA2. It is vascularized anteriorly and it could be useful to anterior canal fossa. It's so difficult too to be performed. If we don't have in the nasal resource, we need to use extranasal tools. The most used is the pericranial flap. It is a great resource, but it is usually one of the last option. In a recent way, uh, it has been used in endonasal senior surgery, not only to close a uh, school-based defect, but also to close a uh, septal perforation. We think that we should take uh, uh, this flap into account uh, in the future and not la like the last option. There are a lot of topics that, that I haven't commented in this talk to a comprehensive analysis, but our aim was to add a general insight in this way. Even so, uh, the, the key message I would like to leave you with are uh, not always is necessary a reconstruction without PS leak, but in fact, uh, the graph could offer us a better healing. Uh, free grafts are a great resource with a, with a low flow leaks, and we think that we should take this option account in our personal flow chart. The nasocetal flap uh, is the main resource in the high flow leaks. Actually, it's, the, it's the, one of the best options in all of the complicated cases. The inferior turbinate flap is a great alternative to close high flow leaks without feasible nasocetal flap. If, if we have no nasocetal flap, I think always in the lateral wall. Thank you. Micro. Micro. Micro, Sam. Thank you, Ramon. Um, could you please present very fast your case report? Okay. I encourage all of delegate to you chat to, uh, to to ask us about any question about this algorithm or any case, or if you have any more information about it. Thank you.
It's okay. Uh, he's a uh, he's, uh, male patient, uh, 65 years old, work in an office, uh, uh, and he has no comorbidity, uh, no smoke, no alcohol. His symptoms were uh, a nasal blocking for three months without dysbosmia, epistasis, or pain. Uh, he was treated by a diagnosis status uh, for three times. Uh, but in the last month, uh, the patient began uh, to have a diplopia and progressive nasal deformity, and then uh, he has he, he was sent to the to the ENT. In the rhinoscopy, we found uh, a tumor blocking of the of the left nasal fossa. Uh, and we performed that biopsy. Uh, it was informed like a differentiated tumor, uh, even a solitary fibrous tumor. Uh, then we, we request a CT scan, uh, an MRI, in which we could see a, a tumor in the anterior third of the left nasal fossa without spreading into the anterior cranial fossa. The tumor uh, displays the lamina papyracea and the orbit uh, laterally, uh, but the old problem in this patient was, uh, uh, was exactly if we could remove all the tumor with only an endonasal approach. Uh, we performed two, uh, a 3D reconstruction, like we can see now. The problem was to ensure where was the tumor coming from. It didn't seem to have an endocranial spreading, uh, uh, and it seemed to come from any place of the anterior third uh, of the nasal roof. Or uh, then we decide to perform a transfacial approach. Uh, we perform, like I, see, I said, a transfacial approach, a paralateral, nat uh, paralateral natural nasal uh, with a lynch incision. Uh, in the first stage, uh, we remove all the tumor to allow us the, the, to access to the base of the tumor. It was a soft tissue and it was removi removed by, by aspiration and it was pseudo encapsulated. The, 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 the second stage was an endoscopic way, an endoscopic approach uh, through the transfacial incision. Uh, we performed uh, a draft three. Uh, uh, to control the anterior limit of the tumor, and then we remove all the tumor from the edmoidal root. Uh, then uh, we had some holes in, in the dura matter with an evident uh, uh, TF leaks, uh, although it was not so high, it was low flow, uh, low flow leaks. Uh, then uh, we harvested a pericranial flap because it was easy to be performed with this approach and then the, the access to the galea was was easy like i said uh, we covered uh, covered all the surface with the pericranial flap uh, in this case uh, we didn't use a lumbar drainage here we have a photo an image of the patient uh, with an aesthetic an aesthetic scar with a cool uh, a good looking a good looking from in the post up three month post up uh, in the follow-up, uh, we didn't find uh, reliefs at three months, uh, although the patient uh, had a little enhanced in the moidal roof and we control it each six months. Uh, it could be enhanced uh, from, the, from the tumor or from the, or from the pericranial flap. We didn't know it. Uh, but uh, two years, uh, they, we found an intracranial relief in the anterior cranial fossa without endonasal spreading. Uh, and and we, we make us uh, two questions. Uh, could we perform an endoscopic approach uh, to remove the, the, the tumor or we need an extracranial or a new transfacial approach? And, and the second question was, uh, the, what kind of reconstruction can we perform in this situation, in this second surgery? Finally, we use it, uh, an endoscopic approach uh, we, with an endoscopic way, uh, remove all the tumor by the, the, the moidal roof. Then we perform a big defect in the moidal roof uh, with a fierce leak. And we use uh, fascialata, fat fascialata, and, free, and a free floor mucosa graft, uh, an extended one. We thought uh, that it could be a good resource for in, in this situation because it, it could cover uh, all the surface of the defect and uh, with a lumbar drainage for five days, 
uh, it do, it, the, the outcomes was so great. Thanks. Thank you, Ramon. To save time, we will discuss with you later because we have almost two cases left. So, uh, Dr. Saad, could you please present your your case? Sure. Thank you, Rasam, and uh, good evening, everyone. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be with among you. Um, and uh, I'll basically just go more clinical uh, about the uh, nasal septal flap. And uh, we'll just go over a case. And uh, it's, uh, this is a case, 28-year-old male uh, presented with uh, tonic chronic seizures, the neurosurgery clinic. And uh, the neuro exam was completely normal, including infection. And he basically came to the rhinology clinic, nothing uh, basically other than just mild, deviated septum to the right anteriorly, normal uh, middle meta and nasal pharynx. And you can actually see imaging uh, showing a planum meningioma uh, with a calcific uh, component. And it's, it was not too big, uh, extending all the way to the cribriform and uh, starting from the uh, supracellular area. So uh, the, uh, the uh, joint uh, endoscopic approach was, uh, was planned and this was the exposure intraoperatively showing the sphenoid in the back with the uh, lateral OCRs on both sides, posterior ethmoids and the, superior, the uh, posterior septum uh, removed and uh, the after during the section of the tumor itself uh, you can see two-handed approach we've basically uh, dissected the whole tumor and uh, took it out all in one piece after the full dissection uh, 30, 30, 60 degrees around it and you can actually see uh, the, the defect in just a second so uh, the defect here is in the planum area. It is, uh, I would say, a high flow leak. Uh, and the question is just to the panel, just to uh, uh, interact a little bit more, uh, probably to uh, start with uh, Carlos, uh, if uh, some doesn't mind. Um, how would you actually reconstruct uh, this in that stage? I'm sure that you've actually planned something even before, uh, but your usual reconstruction. Yes. Uh... For me, like a planum defect like these, I would reconstruct with an inlay uh, synthetic duraft, like I like to use the duragen for those cases, uh, and um, the nasal septal flap. Uh, it's a it's a true plan when it's more tuberculum cella, you know, going lower, like a cranial pharyngioma. I like to do a uh, inlay only fascia lata button graft when you suture two layers of the fascia lata. One goes inside inlay, the other only, and then there's a septal flap on top. So this Thank for you. me is kind of more plenum into your cranial base. So it, I avoid the fascia lata harvesting uh, and I would use a synthetic dual substitute inlay and then there's a septal flap. Perfect. Ramon, would you do anything differently or uh, pretty much the same? Uh, just a microphone, if you don't mind. Sorry. I'm agree. I'm going to use a fascia lata too, and then probably the, uh, an nasocetal flap or, or an extended one if the, the anterior border of the defect is so so anterior, probably. I, I include a, a, little, a little floor or in the nasocetal flap to ensure the, the cover of the, all the defects. If, if the anterior uh, part of the tumor or the, or the approach is, is so, is, is in the moider group. Exactly. Marisam, uh, Sean, would you add anything to what was been told? Um, the same, the, the only one, one issue that if there is a dead space in, uh, in, in, in between. So if I have uh, more space to fill in, I, I keen on some fat in the middle in between the facial lata inlay and facial lata overlay just to keep the pressure and then I put the nasoceptor flap. So you would put the fascia in the first and then some fat and then a fascia on top exactly. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Sean, would you actually add anything? So if I put a lot of uh, 
fat in the middle. Maybe I have some problem with uh, optic chiasm. So yeah. it's Lots of pressure. to measure it before reconstruction. I suppose the only Anything thing about that is possibly putting in, I know it's a little bit controversial, but putting in a, um, either a bit of bone or a bit of cartilage um, to, um, to support it. I know you don't have to, but it just, you, when you look at it and it's sort of sitting there nicely and it's closing it off, it all just makes me feel a bit better. Yeah, so you actually bring up a good point. And I, I, even when in, uh, in my practice, I started with a lot of uh, rigid reconstructions and then, uh, you know, basically tried to not use it every now and then and see what the difference was. And I really didn't find that much of a difference. But I actually found that the, the descent of the skull base itself it's fairly obvious when you don't use a rigid uh, reconstruction as well. So this is what we actually it's chose. Like, just one point, Sad, about yeah. the semi-rigid that Dr. Carey has uh, told. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good point. Actually, for young patients, or sometimes I'm doing the composite flap, I leave the cartilage, a piece of cartilage attached to the nasal yeah. septal flap and they rotate all together. And uh, it's pretty good. It's pretty nice. It I don't, is. I'm having a hard time to prove the the benefit, but uh, intuitivity, it's it's interesting that it, it, you have a more rigid and a more robust reconstruction when you do that. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And, uh, you know, we usually start with uh, trying to uh, basically fill the uh, defect with a little bit of fat and surgery cell, uh, not too much pressure, just not to have a lot of pressure on the or chiasm or the intracranial structures and to actually have a little bit of, uh, and this is what we uh, have, done a lot in some of these cases, a, a gasket seal technique. With fascia lata, we usually get, get fascia lata, but I agree the durogen is similar. And we use a uh, polydioxon uh, uh, plate and we basically suture that to the fascia itself. And the fat is usually used intracranially and this is used on, uh, as a gasket seal technique. And uh, you can see it right here. And this is just the other side of it. So this is where it actually goes in the intracranial cavity itself. And you actually just uh, present it in. And it's a very nice um, uh, seal that you basically feel much better uh, having in some of these cases. And on top of that, as majority of you have mentioned, basically uh, use a nasoceptal flap and rotate that on top. And that'll basically seal everything once all the mucosa is gone and uh, um, the uh, edges of the sphenoid itself are uh, as, uh, smoothened. And a little bit of tissue glue, surgery cell, gel foam, and a uh, non-absorbable pack on top just to keep things in place for a few days. That's our usual. Um, any comments uh, from the uh, panel? Okay. Okay, so uh, just a brief thing about the nasal septal flap itself. Uh, Dr. Haddad and, and the group uh, started it in 2006, and it's been the workhorse ever since of the majority of nasal skull base. I really like the uh, algorithm that, that uh, Ramon has presented. Uh, basically, we use it in almost all cases of high flow leaks and major reconstruction of the skull base itself. And it basically led to a major uh, decrease in the amount of CSF leaks postoperatively. In the beginning, there were 30, 30 something percent, all the way down to less than 5%, even in the expanded approaches. And it can actually reach all the way up to the posterior frontal table, especially if you release it from the sphenopalatine artery area and go all the way to the tergopalatine fossa itself. And, uh, you know, in the majority of times, uh, when I actually uh, start any case, we usually, I usually start with designing how much of a flap do I actually need. So I usually just uh, uh, calculate all the way from the sphenopalatine artery area back to the clivus up to the suprasellar area and all the way uh, anteriorly to the, towards the defect and even increase that by around 15% just to calculate how much of a flap do I possibly need. And that's from an, a, uh, a length point of view. And from a width point of view, I basically uh, calculate that from one side to the other just to see how much of a flap I, I would need as well uh, from the septum in a width point, uh, from a a vertical point of view as well. And calculate that within the nose itself, as we know all, uh, not each and every nose is actually the same. Uh, anteroposterior diameter of the sphenopalatine artery area all the way to the uh, vestibulum of the nose itself 
and the uh, width of the septum itself, around a centimeter below the olfactory cleft itself, all the way down to the uh, uh, to the uh, palate and, or the maxilla, and possibly extend it laterally if needed in some cases, and we'll show one of those cases. So uh, usually this is a, an exposure that I first do in some of the expanded cases. This is a clival meningioma. Uh, you can see a spur, which usually is somewhat uh, making it difficult uh, to actually raise it, but uh, studies have shown that it does not increase the possibility of leaks postoperatively. That's the maxillary sinus on the right side, and the middle turbant has been resected, making sure that you don't damage the uh, sphenopalatine artery area there. And start by seeing the uh, sphenos, sphenoid ostium and starting the, to raise the flap between uh, the uh, above uh, the quena and below the sphenoid ostium itself. And in here, you can actually see that we're going all the way lateral as I would need a, a fairly wide approach uh, in this lady just to cover the defect itself. Uh, I usually use uh, a, a, uh, the monopolar cautery. However, uh, multiple people use uh, cold dissection. And once uh, you, you can basically stop at any point anteriorly, depending on how much you would decide uh, prior to the surgery itself. And this is a clival uh, lesion. And this is where you actually need to put the nasal flap in the maxillary sinus just to have a direct shot towards the clivus itself. So the, um, the pleticle itself should be preserved. And that's the main thing. Uh, I usually tell uh, my fellows never extend the sphenodosteum all the way down and you can actually damage the uh, posterior septal artery, the pedicle of the flap itself. Uh, majority of literature is actually showing multiple pedicles and multiple arteries within that region. However, the majority of times you try to preserve that main artery as much as possible by, by starting the incision above the, below the sphenodosteum, above the coin as much as possible to include all of this and to increase the amount of the pedicle as much as possible before opening up the sphenoid itself. And you can actually see if you actually all the way go down to the sphenoid or extend the sphenoid sinus ostium inferiorly, you can actually damage the posterior septal artery easily without uh, and damage the pedicle. And uh, in some of these cases where it's a, a revision case, uh, you don't have possibly, you possibly don't have an nasal septal flap, you can actually use a Doppler and you can detect whether or not the posterior septal artery is actually intact, and you may use the nasal septal flap at that point. So in terms of olfaction, uh, multiple, you basically preserve the upper uh, centimeter or so of the uh, superior septum, uh, especially up to the anterior head of the middle term itself. And then up to, uh, beyond that, it's fair game to take everything within the nose itself, depending on how much you actually need. And uh, in terms of whether or not you use cold knife or monomal polar cautery, didn't really show any differences in, uh, in, in the studies on long-term uh, olfaction outcomes, whether you use this or that. And the, uh, as, as, this is a nice article you can actually check out in how to preserve olfaction in harvesting a nasal flap. Uh, they proposed, uh, Dr. Casanova's group, a axillary line joining the middle turbinate and the superior turbinate, and anything beyond that above, you basically try to preserve up until the axilla of the middle turbinate and beyond that, you can actually go all the way up and uh, take as much as a, of the uh, septum as you can. And uh, another tip that uh, I always tell uh, residents and fellows is that you always try to uh, get the posterior cuts right and all the way down to the bone because I, when, whenever you raise the flap anteriorly and try to actually take it off posteriorly and have all that redundant mucosa, uh, you would definitely love to have that dissected and done even before doing the anterior um, dissection as well. So that's something just as a tip on the side. And uh, always, of course, you mucosalize and smoothen all the, uh, the skull base that could actually uh, put this in the, the nasal septal flap on, and that's critical. Uh, you want to avoid mucoseals, and it still could happen. You could actually have small little mucosa remnant somewhere here and there. And this is why you have to be critical of removing each and every bit of mucosa within the skull base itself around the area of reconstruction. And uh, the mucosal side itself, some people like actually using a, uh, a blue marker just to mark that side, just to remember and not to twist the uh, pedicle too much. 
And that's something critical that you have to uh, check every now and then and possibly release the nasal flap itself every now and then just to uh, get it to breathe. And you can see how, this is a small little nasal septal flap, but can you see how when, when the mucosal side is on top and it's on bone, that it heals perfectly. And this is six months postoperatively. You can see the edges of the nasal septal flap itself as it healed perfectly within the area that you want if everything is in, uh, in place. And um, this is a, a case of a, a cribriform uh, plate uh, meningioma. And you can see it's draft free and the whole skull base is exposed. And once the uh, resection has been done, uh, you basically rotate the whole flap and can reach all the way to the posterior frontal table, uh, put a little bit of resurgicel, cell, a little bit of glue, uh, this is what I usually do. And then beyond that, uh, you, uh, put uh, gel foam. And uh, what I prefer is metal shell packs. And I usually don't like using uh, balloons. I would love to hear what the panel thinks about that. Uh, I actually leave uh, two to three to four metal cell packs sometimes within the nose, especially if you have a huge defect like this, uh, just to, and layer them on top of each other just to have the pressure on the skull base itself. And uh, it, it uh, heals perfectly and the, and the rates are fairly low, uh, to me at least. Uh, that's uh, pretty much it uh, from my aspect. Uh, try to be more clinical as much as possible. Um, up to uh, Professor Am, if you need any questions, comments. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation, Saad. Congrats. Thank you. You have a lot of questions in the chat. So <laughs> if you don't mind, please yes. answer some of them and we'll ask sure. about more later. So now, uh, Carlos, your turn, please. Okay. So. So thank you very much. Uh, it's a very great honor to talk, to be here with you at the European Rhinologic Society webinar. Thank you, Dr. Alubid, Dr. Kerry. Um, I'm very happy to be here tonight. So I'll show a case about skull base reconstruction. We've seen um, most of the cases where the reconstruction was performed due to a CSF leak issue. And I will show a case where, they because we know the skull base reconstruction is beyond the closure of the CSF leak, but also protection of neurovascular structures. So I will show also a case about the protection of a uh, dehiscent ICA. So this is a 65 year old female. She has a history of in 1999, resection of a left side that's sphenoid skull base mixoid fibroid tumor through a lateral rhinotomy approach. The surgery was in New York City. In 2001, she had a recurrence of this, uh, this tumor and another surgery and post-operative radiation. In 2020, she, pre she presented to the ER in Albany Med, uh, where I was working before, with a left-sided nosebleed. She went to the ER, uh, she had the nose packed with an easy control of nosebleeds. The packing was left for three days, but one week later, she had another bleeding. Uh, she went back to the ER. She had history of bleeding before, but this bleeding was kind of a little bit more intense. And she had the nose packed again with uh, good control right away in the, in the ER. And at, because of the second bleeding, we brought her to surgery. But first I'd like to, she, she brought some exams. So she got this MRI, which is a recent MRI, showed there's no evidence of any um, tumor that was kind of the cause of the bleeding. The cavity seemed to be clean. The nasal endoscopy after the first visit, after the removal of the packing, showed just like some scabby as expected in the back of the nasal pharynx, but no active bleeding, no nothing concerned, no, no tumor and uh, we brought her to surgery. Ideally, our first uh, idea was to maybe, we knew that this patient had this surgery in the infratemporal fossa, so most likely ligation of the IMAX. So our first idea of her nosebleeds, considering the intensity, she, she told us it was coming from the front. It was also a anterior etmoidal artery. So we went ahead to do an endoscopic endonasal ligation of the left 
at my anterior at moidal artery, like you can see here. Uh, you have the frontal sinus on the left side. That's the after the removal of the part of the, the lamina papyracea, we're putting a clip here in the anterior etmoidal artery on the left side. So it's a transorbital endonasal, transnasal, transorbital ligation. We usually put two clips. So that's the frontal sinus on the left, the nasal septum. And then when we're expecting the, the nasal pharynx removing some scab, we notice this. So one sec. We notice this. Uh, it is a lesion, friable, pulsatile, that looked like for me a dehiscent carotid. Later on, I knew it was a, a sealed aneurysm dehiscent, but this is, for me, it was, oh, because of the radiation, and she was having sentinel bleedings of the carotid, actually. Uh, so if you have this situation, you, you don't have the posterior septum, you don't have nasal septal flap available on both sides. So maybe it'll be good to ask the panelists what they would do at this point. Ramon, have any idea? Micro? Yes. Uh, the first uh, is evaluate uh, this alteration uh, by uh, uh, angiography, I think. Uh, I don't know if I do anything in this surgery, it's, if, if it's begin to bleed a lot, uh, probably yes. But uh, if I don't know exactly what, what is that, probably I perform, I, I, I perform a, 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 a angiography, I think. Yeah, I think that's perfect. That's the, I think that's the natural net next step in getting angiography uh, to really assess what's going on. Uh, I just felt that, okay, we, we are here. Um, there is this lesion that can uh, rupture. I know that the, 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 the definitive treatment is with a stent of, in the carotid, uh, but I went ahead and, and uh, did a lateral, there's no other flap internasally, so I did a flap from the left, from the right lateral wall, uh, including the inferior turbinate. So this is the incision into and into your head of the inferior turbinate just for protection. So this is an important step when harvesting a flaps from the from the um, lateral wall is you have the prominence of the nasal lacrimal duct. So we need to transect the nasal lacry lacrimal duct sharply in, in, order, in order to prevent epiphora and release the flap from the lateral wall. So you're gonna see here, I'm using the, the kerosene to really open and expose the nasal lacrimal duct. And, and now we're gonna transect the nasal lacrimal duct, oh, sorry, sharply with the scissors, detaching from the, the flap from the lateral wall. So that's the incision again. Exposure of the nasal lacrimal duct. And transection, and the flap gradually is free, and rotated posteriorly. There are some still that the, so this is a very important step as well. When we dissect superiorly towards the pedicle, towards the sphenopolitan foramen in order to release this flap to, to allow the reach posteriorly. And now we are on the left side of nasal cavity, removing the inferior terminic bone. Ideally, we remove this while the terminal is still attached, but uh, in some cases it's hard. So after the uh, removal of, this is after the removal of the mucosa around because the flap needs to heal, to heal here. So we didn't touch the area of the aneurysm, just moving the mucosa around in order to allow this flap to, to, to heal and protect this region. So then surgery cell, we put surgery cell round, followed by Duracell, the, the biological glue, and the nasal packing. Usually I'm using more and more the marrow cell, which is absorbable, but in this case, I would like a little bit more pressure in the nasal pharynx, so use the, the, the marrow cell. 
So just to illustrate here the incisions of the, the lateral wall flap, the yellow one is superior. Usually it's done when you're doing the maxillary entrostomy. Uh, and then along the nasal dorsum, anterior one in the front of the turbinate, this green one, it can be tailored depending on the, the size of the, the flap you want. It can be at the edge of the inferior turbinate. It's an easy one. You don't need to, you don't need to work in the nasal lacrimal duct, but as long as you go to the inferior meatus and inferior meatal lateral wall, and then there's when you need to ac access the nasal lacrimal duct and transect. And this is an illustration. I have other cases too of the lateral wall flap pedicled anteriorly. Uh, based on branches of the interethmoidal artery and facial artery. So this is a broad pedicle. It's very good as a rescue flaps for anterior coronary base defects like this. But normally this is a, like Ramon said in his presentation, this is a secondary internasal flap that can be used. So this is the post-op uh, CT, uh, post-op endoscopy showing the flap very nicely healed, covering the area of the dehiscence. But of course, Next day after the surgery, this patient underwent to, um, and the same day she got an angiogram that showed the, the aneurysm uh, exactly in the next to the serum segment of the carotid. And she, she had uh, the stent placed. Um, so you can see here the aneurysm and after the placement of the stent, that's really the end of vascular treatment. The, 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 she had radiation, so the, the flap is usually, I feel like it's covering, protecting the vascular structure, but of course it's not uh, strong enough unless you do like a free flap, something like that to be, to hold off of severe bleeding. I just would like to, as a side note, uh, the ligation we did, it really works in terms of the ethmoidal artery, but it was not a problem of the, of the, of the patient, so you can see the clip here inside the orbit, and that's the ethmoidal artery inside the orbit. It blocked the stoppage here before entering the nose. It's very interesting this picture because you think, okay, so let's use uh, left side flap. So we were right. So it, when they did the external carotid on the left, there is minimal flush to the nasal cavity, showing that the 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 IMAX was really blocked, ligated from from the previous surgery in, uh, 20 years ago and also the radiation. And on the, other, on the other hand, the other side, the blush, the flush here in the nasal cavity was normal. So in conclusion, I think it's something that we're gonna see more and more, uh, this endo, these uh, vascular lesions, since the patients are having extensive surgeries, um, with the, especially with the endoscopic and the nasal approaches. So always think, about patients with extensive surgery, especially in radiation, possibility of vascular complications, even 20, 10 years, 15 years later. It's very interesting to use vascular uh, flaps to, even with no CSF leak, just to cover the, the, the exposed vessels and promote more protection. And the lateral wall flap is a great option when the nasal septal flap is not available. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carlos. Thank you for all of you to keep the time so we can ask some questions from the audience and discuss with you. Shen, do you want to start with any question or micro? Some interesting uh, questions here. There was one question which I actually really liked uh, and I think it might be best directed to Saad. Um, the, the, the question's been taken down, but I thought it was a really good question. You kind of alluded it to in your talk, uh, and that was, um, what do you do if your nasoceptal flap isn't long enough, you haven't calculated it properly, and it doesn't cover the defect? I think that's a really good question, and uh, yeah. uh, we, I'd be interested to know what the panel think of that. What would they do when they, um, they find that they're a centimeter too short? Um. Yeah, well, I totally agree. And this happens even when you plan it, even if you actually uh, uh, do it right, you might actually have uh, it being less. And it's most of the time is actually the length rather than width. Um, that's the usual thing that happens to us every now and then. And uh, if you don't mind me, I can actually share the screen. I've actually prepared uh, uh, two slides about that. And extension of the nasal septal flap is actually uh, possible. And sometimes it, you can actually uh, extend the nasal septal flap pedicle all the way to the thoracopathic fossa. 
And you, instead of actually stopping at the Kuena itself, you can go all the way to inside the Tegopatan fossa and dissect within the Tegopatan fossa itself to gain at least a, you know, a centimeter and a half to two. And that would actually increase the length of the nasal septal flap itself. Another group has actually suggested just leaving, and this is especially in the anterior cranial, mostly anterior defects, leaving the sphenoid uh, face intact. Uh, by doing that, you would actually uh, uh, don't go all the way back. And sometimes what I do is I go all the way lateral on the lateral wall and then basically rotate it on top of the anterior skull base itself, avoiding the cella and the clivus in the back if you don't have a defect there. And that would actually also increase the length of your rotator a little bit more, knowing that you might actually compromise the pedicle sometimes if you over rotate. And something that we've actually been experimenting uh, is to actually add a, uh, um, a floor graft, extended floor graft, similar to what Ramon has, uh, has, a, has uh, explained to the nasal septal flap itself by suturing it. And that would actually increase that length approximately to three and a half to four centimeters as well. We'll hopefully publish this as well soon. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's what I sometimes do. Really comprehensive, thanks very much. And uh, I, I, any of the other panel members add anything to that? I think it's great. Saad explained really well, I'll do the same thing. Uh, if they, I notice that the, the um, flap is short, I like to extend all the dissection towards the uh, IMAX, the internal maxillary artery. But ideally it's the best way is to plan really well the reconstruction and avoid to reach the situation that you had to expand during the surgery. Ideally, you know exactly like uh, Saad said and show the measurements, you prepare, prepare for the case and you know exactly the steps. Uh, that would be the ideal scenario. But of course, sometimes you're in a situation that, okay, the defect is a little larger than we're expected, and uh, that was, that's, those are great options. Carlos, while you're, while you're there, what do you, when, you, when you talk about measuring the, uh, how much flap you're going you're gonna to use, that's, that's not easy to do, is it? How do, you, how do you do it for the audience? What do you do? Do you, yeah, do you know how long great. your instrument is, or what do you do? So, uh, yes, Ramon sold great images showing like 3D reconstructions and uh, the measurements. Those are very comp complex. Uh, I usually, what I do is I get a simple measurement from the find in the coronal plane where the sphenopalatine artery is and measure more or less the distance from that to the, to the skull base and the skull base defect that it's planned. And the measurement in the flap the flap is very interesting. The nasal septal flap, not all of that mucosa is the reconstructive area. The, rec the, re the real reconstructive area is the area that covers the quadrangular cartilage, the septal cartilage. So you need to do some measurement area more anteriorly to know uh, if that would be enough to cover the defect. Mm -hmm. So just like in the coronal plane, in this, maybe in the sagittal plane would be even better to measure if a square of that defect that you measured before would be, would be confined in the limits of the flap. Uh, that would be usually the way I do it. Okay, that's great. Uh, Sam, anything to add to that? No, th nothing. No, nope, very clear. So uh, our next question is one that um, uh, I think is a really good, another really good question, and that's about lumbar drains. Uh, and, and perhaps we can e ask each of the panelists, all four of you, including Sam as well, what are your thoughts about lumbar drains in general? Um, and are you a, 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 a pro guy or a cons guy? So I, I can start in this because I can bring my experience in this. We all agree that small defects no need to lumbar drain. There is no discussion about this. Big defect, more than two centimeters, high flow, CSF leak. The question now, do you use or not? My experience, I know that a lot of neurosurgeon and ENT, we discussed with a lot of uh, courses. And high flow, big defect, I always use lumbar drainage. I ha have never ever any complication with lumbar drainage. So I know that there are complications for lumbar drainage, but believe me that in my experience during 15 years doing skull-based surgery for it's safe 
a lot of complication and headache for me using lumbar drainage. Even I do in the third day, I put fluorescein through the lumbar drainage. I double check the defect endoscopically. So if there is a leak, I can do under local anesthesia with some tissue call or any glue and I, I get good result with this. So double benefit from lumbar drainage. I know that there is pros and cons in this, but this is my experience. Okay, thanks, Isam. Um, so Isam seems to be pretty po pretty uh, pro uh, lumbar drain. What about uh, Saad? What about you? Well, I, I totally agree with uh, with Isam that um, the, the majority of the small cases, the low flow leaks, I would I would not even think about using them unless I'm actually using or needing uh, fluorescein. We're actually experimenting with just injecting fluorescein and taking out the lumbar drain as if it's just a, a tap. And uh, in the majority of the expanded approaches, we've been still, as what Isam has mentioned, it's just that we're shy enough that we're not, we don't want to think about what if we, we, we had it. And that's the, uh, the main problem. Uh, you can't really do uh, basically randomized controlled trials on ma in many uh, cases, especially if these cases are fairly uh, far in uh, between. And uh, that's the majority of time. So I usually use uh, lumbar drains for three to four days. We've been experimenting just to stop the lumbar draining uh, as the second day. And then we basically just uh, the third day and then the second day. And we're trying to get the patients not using it and just keeping it in case. And we're seeing that we, didn't, don't, we don't see a big difference. Uh, the majority of the literature is actually a proponent of using it if it's a clival defect uh, and if it is a high flow leak. And in those cases, I'm, I'm especially needing that. But in the anterior skull base cases, you might actually be okay without it. So a, a slight difference in emphasis there. Sad is a, is a pro guy, but we prefer not to be a pro guy if you possibly could. Yeah. Um, Carlos, what about you? Any any cons to lumbar drains that you that, that worry you about lumbar drains? Yeah, I um, I personally don't have uh, uh, I don't have experience in terms of uh, uh, problems with the lumbar drains. Every time we had to use, I never we never had a complication. Uh, but of course, it, it I, we know there is some complications described, like the hematomas they can form uh, overproduction. But but in my in my in my practice we use lumadrine in transclival defects with uh, intradural like posterior fossa. That's the only only time we use. Yeah. Uh, Ramon, any uh, anything to add to uh, what's been said so far? No, uh, we use a lumbar drainage in reintervention usually in in the posterior third of the of the the the, the, the cleaver region. Uh, all, all the times uh, in the anterior cranial fossa, uh, usually we don't use uh, lumbar drainage, uh, low flow leaks, uh, even high flow leaks in the first in the first uh, in, uh, surgery. In a reintervention, usually uh, we use uh, lumbar drainage for 25, 24 to one or two days, uh, and then we block the lumbar drainage and wait for four or five days. Uh, even we, we remove the packing and then we remove the lumbar drainage too. And I suppose the panel would all feel that, that what you would want to avoid is, is using a lumbar drain instead of a poor repair. Because if your repair is no good, then a lumbar drain is, 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 is no, isn't gonna solve the problem. We've got time, I think, for one more uh, question. And uh, this one's for you, Carlos. Um, uh, in the case of the aneurysm, uh, would you worry about mucosa directly on the uh, artery under your flap? Yeah, th that's a very, very good question. Um, yeah, that's a concern. I didn't remove mucosa over the, the carotid. Um, considering the, like, the situation, you know, we have this, I was very concerned about getting a rupture at some point of this, this aneurysm and catastrophic. Uh, the risks and benefits, I just felt that, uh, okay, I'm gonna just cover this uh, with, with the risk of a mucous cell in the future, we're gonna follow this patient uh, rather than leaving that 
uh, aneurysm exposed. Okay, that's good. And I, I suppose for, for those very junior colleagues who um, uh, were looking at that and your, uh, your presentation, your lovely uh, um, demonstration there of an, of an aneurysm, uh, the one thing they wouldn't want to do is, uh, is interfere with it or uh, the aneurysm itself or think about diathermizing it or, or poking it. Yeah. Perfect, yes. No, the, the worker is just around the aneurysm and that's it. Don't touch the aneurysm. <laughs> okay, is, is Sam, have you anything more uh, you want to add before we close off? No, nothing but a quick question only. Uh, do you use antibiotic for all skull based reconstruction? And what kind of antibiotic you use? I use a uh, broad spectrum unceph, the uh, cephalexin uh, here uh, for all patients who had the packing. So nowadays I'm using more and more just the absorbable packing. I'm don't, I don't use the, even in the big reconstruction, like all these skull base, I like to put absorbable packing and just two mirror cell, the one that you need to remove in the bottom to promote a little pressure. But most of the packing, the pressure is from absorbable. So it forms like when it's kind of breaking down, it, it forms this uh, um, semi-solid material that I'd like to, keep, to leave the antibiotic to prevent infections for one week until I, I clean. Zach? Uh, it's a great question, and uh, we're actually in the middle of a, uh, a triple uh, randomized control trial about using uh, the cleanliness of the face as well as antibiotics uh, pre and postoperatively. And what we found is that even if you if you just use intraoperative um, intraoperative uh, prophylactic antibiotics alone without anything else, or you actually use antibiotics postoperatively for what I usually use is around 10 days or so, similar to what uh, Carlos has mentioned. I haven't really found a difference in, in infections or CSF leaks or anything. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, and it's basically uh, life-changing for all of us is that even with using anti, uh, big middle cell packs or anything else, I didn't really find a big difference in, uh, in uh, infections, but we're still in the middle of it and hopefully we'll have the results within the next year. Okay. Come on, anything to add? For one week, uh, antibiotics for one week only. Uh, the rest agree with, with Saad and Carlos. Great. So, Shane? Okay, very good. Uh, one uh, comment we've just uh, had through from Paul Nix uh, from uh, the UK who says dissolvable nasal, nasal packing works very well in all anterior skull base repairs. So I don't think uh, uh, we'd argue with that. Um, so thanks for that, Paul. It's now just time for me to uh, uh, wrap things up by um, thanking uh, all the panel for uh, a really interesting uh, um, discussion this evening. I think there were some really good cases there um, and focusing very much uh, on some of the workhorse flaps that um, uh, we use around the, uh, the globe. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your, uh, your presentations and uh, the work you've put into it. Um, to the audience, thank you for staying with us and we look forward to you joining us uh, on February the 2nd for our next uh, webinar. So all that remains for me is to once again thank the panellists and uh, wish you all a, a good evening. Bye now. Thank you, thank you for all of you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.